Hey everybody, it's Dr. Cummings here from PLNU. Thanks for joining me. In this video, I want to uh, share with you just a little bit about the archaea. The archaea are often overlooked in microbiology courses and microbiology discussions. They're sort of the other prokaryotes. Well, we give a lot of a lot of time to the bacteria um, for good reason, but the archaea are extremely important in certain habitats. And so I want to make sure to understand the similarities and differences between archaea and bacteria in particular. So we'll start with the phylogenetic tree so you can see genetically where they fit into the bigger picture of living things. We'll look at the basic architecture of an archaeal cell, and then we'll focus on the structures that are um, that have some differences. Okay, so the membrane's a little different, cell wall's a little different, the flagellum, which we call an archaeum, is a little different. And they share some inclusions, but not others. And so uh, just thinking about the overall architecture of these archaea is kind of our goal here over the next 10 minutes or so. Now, when we look at a tree of life like this that's based on DNA sequences, we see three distinct branches that uh, organisms cluster into. And we find that all of the eukaryotes that have a eukaryotic cell structure form a single branch. And they get their own branch, we call it the eukarya. And so that's where humans are, and fungi, and plants, and other things that have a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. We used to think, back when I was in graduate school, we would call archaea the archaebacteria, when, when it was believed that they were just an ancient lineage of bacteria. But when we started doing lots of sequence analysis and this sort of a dendogram mathematical clustering with, uh, with DNA sequences, we realized that the archaea and the bacteria are really two separate branches. The archaea share a lot in common with one another at the sequence level, but they're quite distinct from the bacteria or the eukarya. The bacteria then are also clustered together in terms of their, their sequence patterns, distinct though from the archaea and the eukarya. And you notice that both of these domains, these three are at the domain level, the bacteria and the archaea, are prokaryotic, meaning that they don't have a nucleus and they don't have any membrane-bound organelles. These are predominantly single-celled microorganisms and when you look at them, I'll show you a picture in a minute, when you look at them, they look exactly alike, the bacteria and the archaea. So just visually looking at them, it's pretty much impossible in most cases for us to say, oh, it's bacteria or it's archaea. Unlike when we see a eukaryotic cell, uh, if we've got enough um, magnification, we can pretty easily see a nucleus and other structures. Now, I'm not going to have time to, to show any slides on this um, ecological distinction, but it's important to, to highlight that wherever there's water on planet Earth, we find bacteria living. In most of those same habitats, we also find archaea. If the conditions are moderate, so moderate temperatures, moderate pH, moderate salinity, moderate pressure, tends to be dominated by bacteria. And if those conditions are extreme, so extremely hot, um, pH extremes, either alkaline or acidic, uh, extremely high uh, salinity, then we tend to find the archaea predominating. There'll be bacteria there, but most of the what we call extremophiles uh, are found within the archaea, including methanogens, which essentially are extreme anaerobes. Uh, we all know that anaerobiosis happens in the absence of oxygen with processes like fermentation and anaerobic cellular respiration. Um, but all that requires is an absence of oxygen. Archaea that are methanogenic, meaning they make methane from typically CO2 or sometimes acetate, these archaea not only can't tolerate oxygen, they need the entire environment to be reducing. Meaning if there's any iron, it's not Fe3, it's Fe2. If there's any sulfur, it's not sulfate, it's sulfide, 2 minus. Everything's in its uh, most inner, most electron dense state and highly reduced and that's the kind of conditions those methanogens require. So when we think of archaea, think first and foremost of extreme habitats. Think of a, a Yellowstone hot spring or an incredibly anoxic um, swamp or bog. Okay, well, those, those habitats are going to be dominated by archaea. Often I think they get the short shrift because the bacteria are the ones we're concerned about when it comes to um, human health. Bacteria colonize us, and they cause a lot of our infections. Archaea are a very minor player in terms of interacting with the human body, but they're extremely important in soil and water type environments. So let's talk just a little bit about the archaea. Now this picture here, if I asked you what it is, you, you couldn't tell me, uh, because most bacteria look alike, and bacteria look like archaea. Um, these could be rod-shaped archaea, and in fact, uh, the archaea have the same general morphologies, 
most commonly as the bacteria. So that would be the rods, the bacilli, the cocci, and the spirals. Um, now, archaea in some extreme, particularly the halophilic archaea, have some really oddball shapes as well. Sometimes they look like little cubes or little flattened squares. But for the most part, uh, they are going to be rods, cocci, and spirals, just like the bacteria for the most part are rods, cocci, and spirals. And so you can see why they share habitats. They're typically single cell. They're about the same size. They do a lot of the same things. For a long time, we just assumed they were a branch within the bacteria. And it really was genetics that shined the light on us that this is a completely unrelated group of organisms. So if we were to look at the, uh, the ultrastructure, the architecture of a typical archaeal cell, um, the required components are going to be a cell membrane. And we're going to see in a minute that there's a couple chemical differences in the membrane of an archaean compared to a bacterium. There are going to be ribosomes in the cytoplasm. There's going to be a chromosome, typically single and circular, just like with bacteria. Not shown on here, there can be plasmids, just like with bacteria. That the chromosome is going to be held within a nucleoid region. And then there's going to be some op optional material, right? There's typically a cell wall of some kind. I wouldn't consider that optional, but they can have a capsule, just like bacteria can, though it's not required. They can have pili for attachment, just like bacteria can, not required. Um, they can have a flagellum or multiple flagella, though we actually change the name and we call it an archaeellum instead of a flagellum because it's structurally different. Both the motor is different and the proteins that make the filament are distinct. So let's look at a couple of the areas where they're, they're pretty different. Their ribosomes are similar enough, their chromosomes similar enough. Um, but some of these other areas, they're distinct. So let's just look at some of the differences in each of these. So in the archaeal membrane, backtrack, eukaryotic membranes and bacterial membranes, those other two domains, okay, those membranes are made of phospholipid bilayers. We're all familiar with that. We've got phospholipids and the uh, fatty acid tails are, are facing towards one another. You've got hydrophilic heads on either side that can interact with the aqueous phase and you've got this hydrophobic interior and the main purpose of a typical membrane is to selectively be permeable to determine what can go and what can't go now in the phospholipids of bacteria and eukaryotes the glycerol head is linked by ester linkages and if you don't remember what an ester looks like go ahead and look up an ester linkage it's just a certain combination and pattern for where the, the carbons and the oxygens are in an archaeal membrane it's slightly different the membrane lipids are made from long chain alcohols instead of fatty acids so it's an alcohol instead of a fatty acid meaning that it's turmalin as an OH group instead of a COOH group and therefore, when it links to glycerol, it forms an ether bond, which is also slightly different. So compare an ether to an ester, and you'll see how, how there's a slight difference chemically. Why does that matter? Well, one reason it might matter is that ether linkages, okay, the ones that we see in the archaeal membrane, seem to be less susceptible to breaking apart under acidic conditions or high heat. Now, if you go back to what I said earlier about how we see archaea often inhabiting the most extreme environments, this may be one of those adaptations that allows them to do that. So their, uh, their chemistry is a little bit different. Another difference is that in some cases, so here's a, a phospholipid essentially, they may not have the phospho. So on the third, if you've got two uh, long chain, car long carbon chains, uh, not starting as fatty acids, but starting as alcohols attached to the glycerol. Remember, glycerol has, has three carbons. The third carbon can have a phosphate group like in our typical phospholipids, or it might just be an OH group, so it can be a little bit different. When we have it in a, a bilayer, just like we would a, a typical bacterial or eukaryotic bilayer, we call it a glycerol diether bilayer because we've got an ether here, ether here, right? And... It's a, a, a typical bilayer, two sheets essentially, two leaflets pointing inwards towards each other. In some cases, the hydrocarbon tails are actually covalently linked like we see over on this side. So what we then call it is a diglycerol tetraether, tetra one, two, three, four, monolayer. So now all of a sudden, instead of it being a phospholipid bilayer, it's, it's a diglycerol tetraether monolayer. You can still have a hydrophobic interior, you can still have um, molecules moving back and forth with uh, a variety of, of control, transport proteins, etc. You can have embedded integral proteins into it. Um, one thought 
One possibility is that by linking these together, we're less likely to peel the two layers apart, especially at higher temperatures. So again, extreme environments. This may, in fact, be another adaptation to help this membrane stay together under extreme conditions. So some differences in the archaeal membrane. Otherwise, their basic functions are going to be the same. Now, the cell wall in archaea is a little different also. There are two main types, pardon me, three main types that we see. The first is called pseudopeptidoglycan, sometimes called pseudomurine. Murine is a, an old word for peptidoglycan, which is sugar chains cross-linked by peptides, just like peptidoglycan, but it's a different sugar and the peptides are a little bit different. Uh, in some cases, it's just a whole set of polysaccharides. Here you can see some halophiles. It looks like check checks mix. Remember I said some of these halophiles have some really unusual shapes. So we see rods and coxy, but then we see like corn checks and other favorite cereal types. And sometimes these halophiles have some really cool colors. So two possibilities, pseudomurine or polysaccharide. Probably the most common though is going to be what's called an S layer or a pericrystalline surface layer. Now some bacteria will have this as well, but this appears to be the most common cell wall type structure, something that gives integrity and resists turgor pressure, resists bursting of the cell for the archaea. So it's an outermost cell surface layer composed of protein or glycoprotein. We see it in a bunch of different bacteria. It's extremely common in archaea, almost universal in the archaea. Um, and it appears to provide some protection, obviously against the, the pressure, but it may also protect against being predated upon. It may protect against host defenses if they're infecting something, or even some viruses, uh, although in all those cases um, there are predators that still get them, uh, there are viruses that still get them, etc. Here's an image from your book of a, an S layer that was pulled off of an organism. It's this two-dimensional network, like a crystalline structure essentially, very symmetrical, and very likely acts as a sieve to exclude large, uh, large particles like phage. Now the flagellum, so we use the term flagellum to refer to the whip-like tail we see in bacteria. We use the same term in eukaryotes, so it's a completely different structure. In archaea, they gave it a different name, and they call it the archaeellum, because the proteins are different. Now I don't expect you to memorize the names of the different proteins, but we're not using flagellin anymore. In fact, there are several different possible proteins, and we've got a different structure as the motor, and this, uh, the, uh, uh, the filament itself doesn't punch through an LPS layer like it does in a gram negative over here. It's got to fit through some of the holes in what's most likely a paracrystalline surface layer. Now, why do I have a type 4 pillus up here? Well, for one thing, it was in the picture that I pulled off the internet, but I also wanted to be able to tell you that the archaeellum looks just like what's called a type 4 pillus. Type 4 pillus is used for attachment in bacteria, particularly among pathogens to things like intestinal tissue. And in some bacteria, that type 4 pillus can actually be used to move in something called twitching motility. The archaeellum is very, very similar structurally, very homologous to a type 4 pillus that happens to have a rotary motor. So in a sense, the archaeellum is a type 4 pillus that can rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. So it serves a very similar purpose as a flagellum, but it's based more on the type 4 pillus structure, but a rotating type 4 pillus. Uh, and then there are inclusion bodies. Most of the inclusion bodies you've learned about in bacteria apply to the archaea as well. So they can, some can accumulate phosphate granules, um, polymerize them together so they have phosphate available when it's in low supply. Some will uh, hyperaccumulate sulfur. Um, some, you can't see the, the label, oh here it is, polyhydroxybutyrate, PHB granules, little fat lipid droplets um, that they can store. And then some need to float and they can have gas vesicles uh, so that they can float in and out of a, a water column. The two main ones that they don't have that I want you to know is that there are no spore-forming archaea that we know of, and there are none that are magnetotactic, that form magnetosomes and align themselves with Earth's magnetic field. All right, let's, uh, in the last 30 seconds, summarize here the high points. Archaea are single-celled prokaryotes distinct from the bacteria, not a subset of them. They, same, they share the same general architecture as the bacteria, but there are some key differences between the archaea and the bacteria that are found in the membrane lipids, the cell wall, the flagella, which we're going to call an archaeellum, and the inclusion bodies.
Lots of information about IKEA. Go back through it. Make sure it jives with your book. Good luck with this information.